Okay, so uh, the observer. So one way to look at the, the observer or the witnesser is that it's, this is a world of things which are passing, which, of, of things which can come and go. Yeah. So many things in this world are passing by, and yet there is something here that cannot pass by. You know, and even though one may have been alive for whatever, whatever it is, and so much has come and gone, uh, and yet has the, you know, the observer is like, is there something throughout all of life that has never come and gone and can never come and go? And uh, inquiries, self-inquiry is like, oh, is there something here which is eternal? Eternal is a word, but something here which cannot be taken away, which cannot come and go. So what, what are the things then we inquire now, the self-inquiry? The inquiry into, um, first of all, well, it, it traditionally it's like, well, what do I currently see myself as? And is it something that could potentially come and go? Is what I am an object? Does it fluctuate? Does it change? Or is something aware of my experience or identification of my current sense of what I am? And if my current identification of what I am identifying myself as is limited or restricted or contracted, can that be what I am? And um, now, I always like to start off the uh, observer exercise with uh, something as simple as like um, we can use, uh, well I'll use my mug because I, I haven't got anything. I should bring something different, maybe a teapot or something one week. But uh, there's a mug. So a mug, I really like mugs because it's uh, usually to most people that it's a meaningless object. It's a not, it's not a special object. So as I said, unless you're a mug addict, uh, it shouldn't be too. It should be quite easy to have detached observing. And when I sort of share it, sort of hold it in the room, and ask, is anyone the mug? Uh, I haven't had anyone say they are the mug. They sort of seem like uh, got confused that they could be this mug. And and you know, a mug is an object. And I think one of the great qualities with the mug is that it's got a shape, yeah. And the shape is limited. You know, and you as the observer of this limited shape, you know, you see that the observing of a limited object, okay, the observer is not the object. The observer has to be bigger than the object. Because if the, you know, otherwise uh, you wouldn't be able to see the, the parameters. I don't know if that makes sense. You wouldn't be able to see the parameters. The observer has to be bigger, has to be more limitless than the limited mug. Also, a very useful thing with a mug is that I can hold a mug in front of somebody and they have clear observation that they are not the mug. There's what I call detached observing. No one's confused that they are half the mug or that they might be the mug. Or if I was to take the mug away, they would disappear. I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's an object. Okay? So and there's clear detached observing. No one is saying I might be the mug. The other thing with a mug I think is really great is the mug, I can put, hold a mug in front of you and I can hide it and I can say, are you the mug, if I, are you the mug even if I hide the mug and you're not the mug and if I put the mug in front of you, are you now confused that you are the mug and you're still not confused. So a mug can be an object which can pass before you, be here or not be here and yet there's absolute clarity that the mug is not you. There is observing of the mug but the mug cannot be. I think that's a really good thing and if there is confusion then you can just take it back to a mug or an object and, uh, and it's not an exercise of the head, it, this is a spirit, spiritual experiential exercise, nothing to do with rationalizing or making a story about or, or, or trying to figure it out, not, not a head thing. And that is just the first, that's the basics of observing. The next thing then uh, I encourage people to do is to um, experientially experience what am I now? No, not a mental question. I mean, we can actually. One of the biggest addictions is to thinking. That's probably the, the most 
the biggest addiction for most people is being in their in their thinking. So we'll start with that then. So let's start with one of the big ones. So thoughts, you know, thoughts are coming and going. You know, like I might have a thought um, of, um, you know, I need to pay the gas bill. And then and another thought may come like I need to pay the electricity bill. But these are all, these are like objects. You know, it's like a form that flits through consciousness. So what's observing thoughts? And uh, it, you know, and then there should be, an, and then this experience is, oh yeah, there should be a, a detached observing of thoughts. It's like a space opens up. <clears throat> you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to think about this or try and understand what I'm saying, because there's something that observes thoughts, which is, which is beyond thoughts. It's, or I'd like to experience, it's prior to thoughts, it's deeper than thoughts, it watches thoughts but is not thoughts. So this field of observing opens up within. And as you go deeper into this observer, if you go into the detached observer of thoughts and or the observer of the observer, then the thoughts start to disappear. Because it's only, only things are registered where there's interest. Where there's no interest, there's no registration. Just like there's so many objects that one doesn't notice because they're just too meaningless and too boring to register or even pick up, it just disappears from consciousness, it's, it's a nothing. And so thoughts are like a nothing when you go into the deep observer. So there's thoughts. The next one um, would be, is there any sense of, uh, you know, for some people there might be senses in the body, there might be a pain or an ache or a feeling or, or a sensation, I mean, some people may have like a tight stomach or whatever it is. But then if there is that, if there's anything, even if it's, uh, <clears throat> then that is an object with limits. So what's observing? What's observing if it's, for example, say, a tight stomach? Well, what's observing the tight stomach? What's How big is that ball of tightness? And what's observing the ball? You know, another way, uh, or if, um, so just go to the observer of that. If it's like pain, well, there's observing of pain. <clears throat> pain is an object, you know. Pain can be here or pain can not be here, but there is that which observes when pain is here and when pain is not here. So pain is an object which is observed because it wouldn't be, uh, and it can be, one can have no pain, then there can be a little bit of pain, then there can be a lot of pain, but what observes this gradation of it coming and going? The detached observer of pain, does any pain exist in that which observes? So um, that's one that can be observed. Any feelings, any tightnesses can be observed. If all of that is gone, if there's no sensations, shall we say, within the body, and there's no identification with thoughts, another, another very strong identification is the body. You know. Now, I really like doing observing of the body. I, I'm, I'm more, more or less never in body, because I never identify mostly with it. So if you, the, the body is like a shape, there's an awareness of the shape of the body, or the limits of the body. But that is an object. So what's observing the body? The observing, the witnessing of the body, the shape of the body. And in this observing, this detached observing of the body, does any body exist there? No, there's no body there, because the observer of the body is more limitless than the limits of the body, and so that just disappears. Identification with the body. Now, after you do the big ones like thinking, uh, when you're in the detached observer of thinking, thinking just starts to disappear and vanish. Um, if you're, if you go to the observer of any sensations or feelings in the body, they start to evaporate. <clears throat> oh, another, <clears throat> another one, just in case. Some people may have things like tiredness or fog. These, these are more what I call foggy, foggy, um, like cloudy things. Tiredness, I think, is one of the big ones which is like a diffuse fog, but something observes tiredness come and go. There is an observing, just like if there was a black cloud in here, there would be observing of it, just because it's a big woolly mess. doesn't mean there is an observer, because the observer watches the tiredness come and go, and the observer of tiredness coming and going, is that observer, you check there, is that observer tired, and it's not tired. 
it observes tiredness come and go. When there's the detached observing, there's no identification. It's the identification or the interest, the hooking into these passing objects that breeds confusion. That one is almost like if if I had a if I had a mug addict in the room, you know, they would actually say something bizarre, which is like, "I am the mug. I can't distinguish that I'm not the mug," because there'd be so much hooking into it and so much interest and identification It'd be so such a special object that they would, they would sort of enmesh and sort of get confused. But for someone who's not got any interest in a mug, that you're not the mug. And for someone who has no interest in thoughts, there are no thoughts. For so, with someone, with an observing that has no interest in body, the body has never existed and can never, never exist. And even if there's lots of bodies in the room, they, they wouldn't be registered because one is not the body. The sense, now there's the sense, now some subtle ones are the sense of location. If there's any sense of being limited or tied to a location, well, that is an object, you know, or there's a sense of, there's a sense of location. But then what observes a sense of location? What is witnessing location? So if in the witnessing of that, which is, of, of the sense of location, does location exist? The other one is the sense or the tracking of time. I mean, these are subtle ones, but there is a sense of time. But then what observes? Is there a detached observing of this sense or this tracking of time? And does time exist in that? So as you get now in this observing, does this observer of all of this, now you're in the observing space, but is this observer, is it limited, contracted? Is it as big as this room, but doesn't go farther than this room? Then what's observing this contracted observer? Now, if the observer is registering something in the world, like it seems to be slightly interested in thoughts, and, or it seems to be interested in time, or, in, or whatever it is, that's what I call an interested observer. It's an observer that has some kind of vague fascination with things that are going on. Okay, okay, well, okay, this is, it's sort of a detached observer, but it seems, seems to have some fascination in things going on in the world. Then be the observer of this observer. What's observing an observer which has interest in things in the world? And in this observing, is there, you know, is there anything going on here? So just keep going deeper and deeper. At a certain point, you know, when there is nothing else to observe, when there's limitless, limitlessness or oneness, it's beyond a this and a that, when that's gone, of course, there's no need to carry on. One is in the infinite or is in the limitless, or one, ha one has lost all track of separation. And so that, that just to allow that to be the, the nature of what can never come and go, or can never pass, or can never be born, or can never die. So with that, let's do, um, <coughs> uh, so if we say five minutes to just